We have Jerry Zecker, the chief of the core master planning team, Andrea Kuhn, who is the senior planner at the Corps of Engineers, and Mark Gillum, who is the principal of the Urban Collaborative. Uh, they're going to discuss the planning, U master planning UFC, which came out last year, and key implementation strategies. I would also like to congratulate our team, our master planning team. They were just notified today that they have received an award from the Federal Planning Division of the American Planning Association for their work in, this, in the development of this UFC. So congratulations, guys. And I will turn it over to Jerry uh, to discuss. Okay, uh, thank you, Lindsay, and welcome everybody to our conference on Master Planning UFC. This Master Planning UFC is really a, a really a, a great change in the way we do master planning for our Army profession, probably in the last 25 to 30 years. It really has brought us up to the current practice of planning. And so, uh, between myself and Andrea and, and Mark today, we are going to really show you uh, basically what is the UFC, where we are, where we've been, and, and the strategies we can use to help make great plan for our facilities for our bases for today and tomorrow. Uh, next slide. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to be able to um, set the stage for you, talk about the guidance, that, how this got to this situation where we have the new UFC and also how this relates to competency of the practice of planning and how this all ties together into raising the understanding of planning. Uh, Andrea is then going to talk about the problems and co cost of energy efficient development and then she's going to talk a little bit about the uh, 10 UFC strategies and uh, Dr. Gillum is going to be talking about uh, several case studies that we've been using, using to uh, this UFC to implement great planning for installations, and then I'm going to be able to come back to me and be able to conclude for the project. Uh, next slide. Uh, so let's just start talking about guidance and training, and how did this idea about planning needed to be updated to what we have right now? Next slide. You know, we t we talk about nexus of, of things coming together, and really, we were living in a time that when we had a, a unified facility criteria for master planning, really what we and DOD and all the services were doing, we were practicing planning, basically adapting 60s and 70s level of planning that looked at more sprawling development. And we had a good opportunity here, so at the same time, the president in October in 2009 issued an executive order on federal leadership, environmental energy, and economic performance. When that is executive order, there's a lot about building design, but there was a piece of that executive order that's very important. Operate high performance, sustainable buildings in sustainable locations. The key is not just the buildings, but sustainable locations. That really starts talking about, do we really have the right planning practices to be able to be, to provide sustainable locations? Next slide. And more if you look at the executive order, you start looking at what we describe as sustainable uh, uh, locations is pedestrian fr fr friendly, near existing employment centers, public transportation, plan 10 town centers. These are also values and words that are, that are uh, not uh, uh, is not just for the uh, uh, sprawling development, but talk about more compact, walkable community. And, and that kind of uh, uh, requires us to rethink how we do a lot of our planning for our installations. At the same time, when you read these things, and many of you are members of the American Planning Association, you see these same kind of values we see in our cities and towns of America. So is there a way to really relook the way we plan our installations? Next slide. So, we started working on this thing called a Master Planning UFC, and, and we'll get more of the details about it, but really, even the interest in planning of installations was not just our planning community, but also not even OSD, but our Congress has really seen the need to be able to create great master plans to not only provide mission requirements 
today, but long-term uh, uh, preserve our military capabilities for the future. Because really, our military installations are one of our most precious resources, and we need to be able to protect them for today and preserve them for tomorrow. And if you look even in the National Defense Authorization Act, it really cites specifically that commander of each military installation shall ensure installation master plans are developed to address environmental planning, sustainable design development, sustainable range planning, and real property planning and transportation planning. So it's our Congress and public law has really start saying this is a requirement to be able to provide our citizens trust on in military installations. With that is uh, we have developed this uh, UFC that basically did two things. It created new planning strategies and practices for DOD installations as well as a set of standards and common requirements for planning, including training. With this UFC has basically given a common approach to planning through DOD that all the other services are basically beginning to implement in, in the way they plan their bases and installations. Uh, for example, the Army is in the, in the final approval of Chapter 10 of AR 420-1 on master planning. Uh, for all you old, old planners, that used to be 210-20. They're integrating into 420-1 and basically uh, talking about roles and responsibilities as well as really implementing the UFC into uh, uh, master planning policies. And the other services are doing the same thing, including the Air Force with their comprehensive planning regulations, the Navy and Marine Corps. So you're seeing a common approach to planning across the, ho the whole horizon of DOD. Next slide. So how do we get there is what we started with is a process where we worked, you know, when we started this effort, we were just wondering first, can we even get the services to agree? So we were actually sort of looking at what are the key planning strategies that we have in, in, in DOD that we can all agree to as a common approach to planning. And, and then when we started working with our peers or the services, we all kind of agreed on the planning strategies but also agreed on a common, what is a master plan? What is a common product that when we see that, that provides a communication of what that planning is occurring? And so we have been able to do that. So this UFC created a common approach to planning, but also it did adopt a lot of the best practices of planning for, they included sustainability, energy efficiency. We, we went out and outreach to the American Planning Association, the U.S. Green Building Council, and other, other professional agencies to be able to make sure we are uh, adopting not, out the, not just out of the park planning policies and practices, but really what the good solid uh, practices that we needed to adopt. And uh, with that, uh, we were able to complete this UFC 2-100-1. It was signed uh, last, uh, last May 15, 2002. Uh, uh, the Under Secretary of Defense for I and E, uh, 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 she signed it last last May, and she actually uh, last year. Next slide. So, um, for all of us, you know, one thing is planning is a process. It does. You just never stop planning because our installations are vibrant, changing, and like any city or town. It always changes, so we always have to revise and update our plan. But to be able to share a plan, we as planners just don't plan internally, but as planning is a is an intent, intent of all the stakeholders and leaders on the installation. What is the future to do that? To be able to communicate that vision is is this thing called we call a master plan. We in the Army call it the U, uh, Real Property Master Plan. The uh, uh, Air Force calls it Comprehensive Plan. And so, but basically this thing called installation master plan. So the, what the UFC did is establish a basically a common uh, framework from what with the, this, this plan will be described. It set up basically a five component document. It started with a vision plan. The vision plan that basically sets the direction of planning development for the installation. This is not a mission statement, but basically talking about the, the guidelines and and dreams of where future development of, of real property and installation land on that installation. So you have a vision plan, a framework plan that basically sets this, uh, the framework of development for the installation and basically uh, in a, a future development plan. To be able to implement a vision plan, the next uh, another component is the installation development plan. And in that development plan consists of district plans, we call them area development plans, ADPs, 
where we be able to basically frame the development of the installation and to, to define districts for the installation. These ADPs are basically neighborhoods on the installation, and they all are, are put together like a quilt. And this stitching of the quilt is these installation network plans, which is all the utility lines, the uh, green plan, infrastructure plan, transportation plans, and basically all these plans to be able to put that together. And also a regulating plan that basically guidelines development of the installation. All that is packaged together is the installation development plan. Also with an installation development plan is common standards. This new thing called, new old thing called the installation planning standards. We in the Army call the installation design guide. And it, but this design guide is not the design guide of all which 400, 500 pages, but a succinct set of planning guidelines. We call them planning codes. Like you, like you go when you build a house in a neighborhood, you have to go to the planning office and they give you planning codes. We will have the same planning codes for installations that basically set up building standards, street standards, and landscape standards. They configure that as just a regulating the type of use of land and how the land is developed for the installation. So we got, this, we got the vision, we got a development plan, we got some system planning standards, then we got to be able to implement this. That's a do, uh, do, uh, document development program where we have basically, as projects are evolved and developed and proposed to the installation, they must be compliant with this master plan and this development plan is evolved to the planning process. That includes analysis of requirements, that includes the tabulation of existing required facilities, as well as a list of projects of all funding stream to help implement that plan to come to life. That's the development plan. We in the Army call it the capital investment strategy. But other, uh, the other services call it from the Navy integrated project list. But it's all the same thing, being able to have an investment that guides the plan. And then summarizing this plan for all the stakeholders to see that they'd be able to share the intent of the future, which is a summary plan. We in the Army call it real property development plan. So really that's the framework of a plan to be able to do that. And it's not really linear, it just goes through a every section of the time. But you know, at the same time as we are developing this policy planning is, is, for example, the Army has really been a leader in adopting this UFC and actually early development of the Army regulation and master planning helped help develop this UFC. They actually went ahead and established action policy that sustainable planning leads to leads to development. So really is is said the action policy and sustainability includes create more compact and sustainable communities. That's really the new planning UFC. So what it basically says is we have to relook the way we plan our installations, be more compact, reuse what we have, and 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 take advantage of some energy sustainability fact practices to be able to be a more sustainable community. Next slide. So what we have done is is in the role of responsibility, uh, we serve the Army as a technical lead for master planning for both the MCOM and AXM and be able to provide a uh, lot of the uh, uh, master planning support to help installation do great planning and provide some of the best practices for the Army, MCOM, OCAR, and, and, and the Army. So what we have been uh, doing is, is actually at the highest level is in our USAIS campaign plan have recognized the importance of planning support to meet the DOD missions. And actually in our goal 1B2 of our campaign plan is a requirement to have consistent level of planning capabilities throughout the Corps of Engineers geographically based. So, so what we basically saying is, is be able, part of the design and construction that we provide is to being able to understand the long range planning implementation, understand the planning guidelines to be able to help drive how we design and build things. We also have been able to work with the Comprehensive Planning Working Group, which is a DOD forum of all our uh, other services, to be able to continue the uh, development of best ideas and best practices. Because one thing about this planning UFC is it we have to learn is it's not just on the shelf for another 25 years. As new practices evolve, new things come out that we find a, a common practice to be able to update and keep this current. So be, we, we, we have normal meetings or conference calls with our peers and other services to be able to keep the project, the guidelines current. But the other piece of the pie is being able to what is this idea about planning as a profession? Because when you talk about planning, it's not just engineering doing a 1391, but be able to understand the practice of 
of what planning is and, and how to do it professionally, sustainably, uh, and then be able to think comprehensively. So what we see, saw was a community of basically more engineering trades and not really looking at holistic needs. So what we established was this DOD Master Planning Institute I'll talk about in a minute that basically gives accredited educational training to our stakeholders, to our profession, and, and, uh, and other associated professions, the architects, landscape architects, engineers, program managers, the general public, and as to be able to have this consistent approach to training. The other piece is we have uh, involvement with really leaders help of our installations help guide and inst guide the way the plan is developed. So we, we have been focusing a lot of help uh, educating our garrison commanders of what planning is and their role to champion great planning. And then we've been working great with uh, MCOM and, and other services to be able to have on-site practicums where we provide hands-on educational training to our installation community at large for, uh, for them to understand what planning is and, and hands-on and their role to pre help produce great plans for the installation. Next slide. So this is uh, really uh, the master planning and training curriculum at the left. We uh, have about seven classes that, that we have this and, and, uh, and that will help give the common practice of the planning, all accredited by APA, AI, AIA, US Landscape, uh, American Society of Landscape Architects, and be able to give a common approach to planning through not just the Army, Army uh, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, the federal service and general public. And, and also one of these is energy and sustainability, where we actually tie in uh, how to use the plan to create a goal to be net zero and achieve the values of energy and sustainability. And if you want more information about that, is uh, uh, that website is DOD MPI, which is a current curriculum. Next slide. So when we talk about case studies, you're going to see a couple of case studies, but 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 army specific. But really, this this movement of the way we are planning our installations is much bigger than just the army. And and what we're seeing is all the services really championing this idea about compact, sustainable, energy efficient installations. A uh, champion of this really started at Joint Base Lewis McCord. They were the first ones to adopt this practice back in 2007, and they have just been a from a plan to a vision, they actually, the projects they have seen on their installations uh, from the streets to housing, to family housing, to barracks, they're all following this, the new updated plan for the installation. So they've been, been really one of the leaders in being able to adopt this practice. So what we see at the Joint Base Lewis McCord is updated to that master plan. The Navy's proto, uh, prat, uh, prototype was basically the whole Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. And we have been working with the, joint, the uh, U.S. Army, uh, U.S. Navy uh, Pacific, and be able to create a new morphology for development for installation development for the joint base, which is a, a massive Navy installation. And now with the Air Force joint together to be able to create a vision, creating a series of districts, being able to create an, an integrated investment strategy, and actually look using the investment strategy to be able to. To, to identify efficiencies that, that was gained by joint basing uh, proposal for the for Pearl Harbor Heckham. So it's been a very, very interesting uh, process. And that now this part, they're using this to actually create an integrated investment strategy for both SRM, MILCON, and other preparations at a huge base as well. We're doing the same thing at Buckley Air Force Base or outside Denver where we're doing the same kind of, basically setting a template for Air Force uh, planning for all their bases as well. Very similar to the Marine Corps, and through our practicum progress, the Army being able to be able to help excite installations to be able to adopt and, and, and champion planning for their installations. Next slide. So if you, for a lot of you in the installations is uh, one thing that we are working on is uh, is basically uh, upgrading and making sure our supporting districts for installations have a competent, consistent planning support through our geographic uh, districts around the, around the world. So uh, what we are establishing seven planning support centers worldwide that will be able to have in-house and contracted capabilities to support installations. 
we will be able to have seven, at least seven stood up before operating by end, end of 2013. We're in process right now. Uh, five of them are, are basically up to stand. We've got a couple more we're going to be working on. So basically give you all uh, support to be able to do that. The uh, second piece is uh, we were working on uh, with Axum OSD is this idea about capacity planning. Because with capacity planning, is the side benefit is planning processes, you're going to be able to calculate what's the maximum buildable capacity for your installation. That is remarkable to be able to handle rapidly changing stationing, but also it's going to be great if when we go into uh, 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 the uh, base closure to be able to intensify capacity. Uh, we've got great examples of that at Fort Hunter Liggett where they've been able to identify additional capacity for, for, for new missions that they didn't even realize they had. And then the last piece of the pie, what a planning effort can do for us is plan-based programming. So basically using the plan to focus investments on the best use of limited resources for installation. So really the plan drives where things are going and it tells you the best way to invest in our resources and then be able with that plan create an investment strategy that the Army and MCOM can use to have a more consistent approach to investment. So that's really how this plan is coming together and to help uh, create invest better investments and better use of our uh, installa uh, installations. Next slide. So what I'm going to do, I've talked about how we got to here, but I'm going to ask Andrea to talk a little bit more about the problems and cost of any efficient development. Andrea? Hey, thank you, Jerry, and um, pleased to be here today. I'm going to move rapidly through the next series of slides because uh, we only have an hour. In looking at the problems and costs of energy and efficient development, we'll start with the first problem, which is that our installations are auto-focused. This may look like a typical suburban type shopping center, only in this case, it's the BX at Aviano Air Force Base. It's designed to look like an Italian development with a clock tower and arches, but it's completely the opposite of European planning, which incorporates retail, commercial, and residential, all within walking distance of each other. Our second problem is that our installations are abundantly paved. As this quote here says it all, suburbia may be paved with good intentions, but mainly it's paved. This is a typical area ground depiction showing the amount of paved areas and inefficient use of space. Problem number three, widely spaced buildings. When we do a figure ground comparison between neighboring downtown Olympia, Washington and Joint Base Lewis McCord, the differences are startling. The abundance of open space at Joint Base Lewis McCord, even though they may have claimed that they didn't have any more developable land when they first did their planning is evidenced here. Problem number four, our land uses are clearly segregated. As we've often heard military planners say, if you look at any base you'll see the same type of land use pattern. We color code our different uses such as residential in one area, commercial, admin, etc. and they're all separated which contributes to the problem of energy and efficient development and necessitates the use of an automobile to travel anywhere. Problem number five, energy inefficiencies. When we graphically depict energy use, in, as we see in this chart, it's clear that interior lighting and HVAC contribute to well over half of the energy consumption. We can use strategies to create structures with elements to decrease energy consumption, such as buildings with narrow wings of 40 to 50 feet. And we'll, we have another illustration of that in just a minute. So we look at the costs. What are our costs? The first one is air pollution. And I, if I could see each of you, I would probably ask you to raise your hand if you drove to work or if you drove to a subway or carpool or wherever. But that, in, in essence, is typically our um, most polluting daily activity. Climate change, uh, while many people we're skeptical at first. Climate change is increasingly recognized as a key factor now and in the future. Roads, utilities, and schools. The costs are high as, with our current pattern of development, mostly because we can't walk anywhere. 
And yes, it really does cost an arm, a leg, and your firstborn to be able to fill up your tank nowadays. And uh, what we find is that people don't really change their behavior patterns unless they're personally affected from a monetary standpoint. Then we see people start to look at alternatives such as walking or carpooling or taking public transportation. Cost number five, vehicle miles traveled. When we look at the transportation impacts in a compact neighborhood compared to a sprawling neighborhood, we can graphically see the difference. And I think this graphic depiction really says it all. The small amount of area needed for a pedestrian, whereas a car needs 1,400 square feet when you consider the roadways and parking areas. So let's take a look at the solution, and that's where the UFC comes in with its 10 strategies. The first strategy in the UFC is compact infill development. Small installations such as NADEC Soldier Systems Center can create more compact development by infilling new buildings within the existing structure and creating walkable campuses. At Joint Base lewis McCord. They're creating bicycle lanes, bus lanes, multimodal opportunities, and encouraging development along transit lines, thereby promoting sustainable energy efficient developments as depicted here. Another key element is horizontal and vertical mixed use. At Fort Belvoir, you'll find 500 housing units, which were built as infill development, within a five minute walk of the town center which has retail development at street level and two-story apartments above. There's also a housing welcome center and convenience type shops such as a barber, Starbucks, Subway, dry cleaners, and, and other uses such as those. If we continue with our sustainable planning component of the USC, connected street networks are very important. On the left side, you'll see a typical site plan with segregated uses. And on the right, a town center type development anchored in the center um, with commercial and retail and office space and surrounded by housing units so that the occupants of the housing units can easily walk to retail and commercial areas. And a school in the lower right hand corner is also within walking distance of the housing unit. Next in the series of sustainable planning is low impact development. Again, at Joint Base lewis McCord, um, by creating pervious surfaces such as grassy areas and trees, they've um, expanded the parking lot with um, pervious rather than impervious surfaces. By using multi-story construction such as that at Fort Sill, uh, we can create more compact development. Narrow wings, as I mentioned earlier, allow daylight instead of artificial lighting and uh, thereby decreasing costs and create an improved working environment for the occupants. Operable windows and a passive HVAC system further add to the sustainable development aspects. And this is at Ellsworth Air Force Base. Resource preservation is the second in the series of UFC um, 10 key strategies. And this resource preservation in terms of natural, historical, and cultural. As you can see in this photo, the uses have changed over time, but we, we have to be aware of our potential impacts and we have to look at alternatives and mitigation measures as we continue to change um, the land use. Defensible planning is the third strategy in the UFC. And uh, we have the Defense Critical Infrastructure Program to protect our critical infrastructure infrastructure. It's basically a capability focused risk management program. And the master plan should ideally incorporate a DSIP analysis to minimize risk to the installation's strategic infrastructure. Healthy community planning is shown here by people walking everywhere. No matter what the weather, um, today we, I know we had to use our umbrellas here in, in the DC area. But uh, whatever we can do to promote pedestrian or, or bicycle use, uh, making installations uh, better places to live, work, and play. Area development planning is the fifth strategy in the UFC. By creating smaller area development plans within the larger master plan, 
It allows us to systematically plan areas and aids in creating a logical sequence of development. This is especially important right now with our limited funding environment. Here's a, an image at Fort Carson uh, with de depicting um, areas of current and future development. Form-based planning is the sixth strategy. We can use form-based planning as a guideline for minimum and maximum building heights, setbacks, circulation patterns, et cetera. Uh, rather than looking at type of use, such as admin or housing, we're depicting the volume and the scale of the development. And this is good for both short-term and long-term development. Number seven is network planning. It may be a little hard to see on your screen, but the color-coded network shows various transportation routes, whether they're multi-way boulevards in red or boulevards in blue, parkways in green, main street in violet, and um, other supported streets such as alleys and, and that type of thing. Number eight is capacity planning, which is probably another area that's more important than ever, determining an installation's maximum development capability or capacity. Um, and this is based on conformance to the installation's planning, vision, goals, and objectives. Areas need to be identified and reserved for future growth in a planned manner. And the difference between the existing condition and future build-out is the capacity. This way, planning can be proactive and again occur in a programmed rather than a haphazard method. Capacity planning shown here at Fort Hunter Liggett with various future uses labeled with, with the lettered um, areas depicting future building and um, showing a radius of a, a five minute walk within that particular area. Facility standardization. Um, we, through standardized design and construction, we we can provide consistency, and this can result in economies of scale. Um, the important point here is that standardized facilities comply with the master plans in terms of area requirements and spatial relationships. Um, but I'd ask you to look at the difference between these two uh, photos. We have the company operations facility at Fort Lewis in fiscal year 05, which is basically a compact multi-story development. And then the cough in FY07, which looks like a sprawling, um, kind of um, sprawled out in installation, which um, really is, is not preferable. So we have to work with design and development to ensure, again, compliance with the master plan. Number 10, at which is our last strategy, is plan-based programming. And this it really should be last. Um, because we want to program to the plan, not plan for the program, which often happens, unfortunately, and has occurred in the past quite frequently. We hope with the new UFC that we'll have more plan-based programming. Well, that is a very quick overview of the 10 strategies of the UFC. And I'd like to turn things over to Mark Gillen now. And um, we will just get his next slide set up. So Mark, we can't hear you. Um, if you click on the uh, microphone icon at the top of the screen, you should be able to uh, go ahead and speak. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. So if you can advance to the next slide, I'm going to be going over two case studies. First, Fort Hood and then Natick Soldier System Center. Uh, Andre and Jerry talked about Joint Base Lewis-McChord. When we did that, when it was initially Fort Lewis, 
there was a bit of pushback in that people thought, well, that could be done out on the left coast where they think about ideas like this, but really could it matter for the Army as a whole? Uh, so we were sent down to Fort Hood, and the idea is if it could happen at Fort Hood, it could really happen anywhere. As many of you know, Fort Hood kind of leads the Army in many things. Uh, certainly it's one of the largest installations. So we began a process at Fort Hood to apply these strategies that Andrea just talked about. Next slide. And it really began. Mark, yes. It's coming in, it's coming in a, a, a little uh, fuzzy. So if you can take the microphone a little farther from your mouth, it might come in a little okay. more clear. How's that? Any better? That is perfect. Okay. Thank you. So the Fort Hood planning process began with a visioning session, a two-day session uh, that had incredible stakeholder engagement. And that was a headquarters use ACE initiative. And then that's been followed by a Fort Worth managed process uh, that began thinking about a whole series of aspects from a Memorial Park master plan to a series of area development plans. And as you can see, it's about a two-year effort uh, that's underway. Next slide. And that began with the vision workshop. And this is a key, and this also is a key aspect of the UFC for installation master plan that says we need to begin with a vision. Uh, this headquarters-led effort drew in about 150 participants. It gave us the guidance. The participants created the vision statement for the installation. You can see there it ties into their idea of being a great place. Uh, very straightforward. They wanted accessible campuses, walkable small towns, and modern energy efficient infrastructure. And that vision statement guides everything they do. You'll notice that it's not directly tied to the current mission. Certainly it supports the current mission. But what we build today will probably long live past uh, any current mission. So the idea of creating that vision is key. Next slide. And it was done with stakeholder engagement. The second image on the upper left, that's the garrison commander at the time, Colonel Mark Freitag. He was heavily engaged. The senior leaders from the installation were engaged because they're actually creating their own plan. The consultants were facilitating the process, uh, but they're actually becoming the planning team. Next slide. And it wasn't just thinking about what they want at the time. Uh, we spent time in detailed document review, looking at existing planning documents, programming documents, uh, environmental cultural documents. So that was a key piece. Oftentimes, we found that people never looked at their own documents. So it gave them a chance to extract key principles from those documents. Next slide. And then we went to areas. So the fact is, we weren't going to bring Seattle to Killeen. Uh, we asked people to identify what areas they liked and that we could learn from. Georgetown, uh, just a few minutes away from Killeen, a great model of what Andrea talked about in terms of the strategies. So we built principles from that one. Next slide. And then out of the workshop, we created a framework plan that subdivided the, the installation into 11 identifiable districts. Each district then eventually would get an area development plan consistent with the UFC, and those ADPs would have a regulating plan as part of that. The great finding here is there is only funding for the vision session and the vision plan. But after the senior leadership saw the value of planning, over time they funded all 11 area development plans uh, for work. Next slide. Backing up the vision is a clear set of principles. Think of a checklist. So here, for example, for the district, we had principles for transit-oriented development, 10-minute uh, walks, street front buildings. And you can see how they support the various goals out of the installation planning vision. And we did this for buildings, streets, landscapes, and open spaces. Next slide. That then transitioned into specific area development plans for each of the districts. And there was a vision for each of these. So Clear Creek Darnell, that was the area where there is a significant town center. This will be a new town green surrounded by housing, possibly ground floor retail uh, with housing above, similar to the Fort Belvoir model. And the housing partner has been an ex a very engaged uh, part of the process. Next slide. That kind of vision is supported by uh, an ADP illustrative plan uh, and a regulating plan, uh, which doesn't look like that's showing up on slides 55 and 56. So we'll go to slide 57. Uh, I'll have to turn to Lindsay. I wonder what's going on. We're missing the illustrative plans here. Just keep on going. I'm going to work on seeing if I can get those uploaded. Um, I'm probably just going to need to share my screen. So if you give me one second, I'll work on that. Okay. So I'll explain the process that occurred is once we identified those districts, each of the districts had a week-long planning charrette. 
uh, that was attended by all of the stakeholders that had buildings or an interest in having buildings in those districts. And this is key that at the district level, the participants are actually creating the specific plan for that district. As part of the week-long effort, we would go through and do a building condition assessment. We'd look at all the building conditions. We'd look at the street conditions. We'd identify what principles were appropriate for that district. All of the district users would be engaged in that process. They would then do a site walk. We'd spend about a day walking around the site, uh, identifying the assets and liabilities of the site. And then they'd create alternatives. Typically, three alternatives uh, would be created. Uh, we'd evaluate those against the vision to make sure which one was consistent. And then they'd work on a preferred alternative. And then they would be doing the outbriefing to the senior leadership, which is very important. Uh, that, again, the plan comes from the installation. So you're seeing on Lindsay's screen, uh, this is the Clear Creek Darnell ADP. So just as what the UFC calls for, it shows current and future buildings, roads and landscapes and parking, and identifies what the capacities are. So Clear Creek is more of a town center model. On the right is a $600 million new hospital, and the center left is a new $30, $40 million exchange with new infill housing where there was just warehousing before. So it works at that kind of scale. Next slide. It also works when we think about how to regulate it. So this is the regulating plan. It replaces the land use plan. So it's think of a land use plan on steroids. But it gives us some clear direction and guidance on where to go, oftentimes using other people's money, whether it's the exchange or MedCom or housing. Most of this would not be done uh, by Milcon. Next slide. But it works also for other areas. So First Cab is a mission area, not really a housing area at all, not a quality of life area, but a mission area that has temps and coughs and motor pools and barracks. So the process works same. And we had uh, great leadership engagement with the First Cab ADP. Next slide. And the regulating plan model uh, works as well for this type of area. It also works for industrial areas. We had a week-long charrette at Quartermaster Park, which is their logistics center. Uh, similar process, we had AMC and uh, Log Center folks with us the entire week working their plan and alternatives. Next slide. And it works at the level of identifying building repurposing. So along with the new hospital, they had to identify what their old hospital should be used as. So this was a repurposing course of action, converting it to admin and warehousing rather than demolishing it. Next slide. And this is the same with in terms of the exchange, uh, the exchange, rather than demolish the exchange, cutting in some light wells and actually showing how it can be repurposed as some DPW support admin and some warehousing. So all of this adds tremendous capacity to the installation. Next. What we're going to be moving forward with is the Area Development Execution Plan, again, another headquarters initiative. And this will serve as the detailed capital investment strategy for the district. And it gets us to what Andrea talked about in terms of plan-based programming. We now have a plan, so let's program to that plan. We identify SRM, other people money, MCA projects that are needed to execute the plan, both at the vertical and horizontal level. So it helps us synchronize funding across a variety of streams. And we're actually going to prototype this and connect it to Builder uh, to show how this can work with that, that important system. Next. So that works at a large installation, and we identified a tremendous capacity in order to, to support existing a new mission. But it also works at the smallest uh, installations. This is Natick Soldier System Center, a research lab outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and we had a similar process. And their goal was to be this kind of sustainable research and development community. They wanted a walkable campus. So there were three districts here, the South Campus Research Area, North Campus Industrial, and the Housing Area. And you can see some images. Uh, so there is a series of goals and objectives. Next slide. The participants spent a lot of time walking around their site. Oftentimes, it's hard to get out of the office. Uh, so when the process like this comes into play, working with the garrison commander, Colonel Carriato, uh, on the right top right image, very engaged. And this is important, getting the leadership engagement early on and throughout the process. Next slide. So some of the things they do, this is a building condition assessment where they identify this building is in decent shape or green. There are yellow buildings that need to be repaired. Red buildings are ones that wouldn't stick around. Next slide. 
and that helps us start to think about the capacity of the installation. Here, the dark brown buildings are proposed new buildings, the tan buildings are existing, uh, so it gives us tremendous capacity that they already have users with their own pots of money willing now to come to the installation to start to fund buildings consistent with the master plan. Next slide. And just some images. This is showing how we can do infill development along a campus walk. Next. And this is that campus walk down below. So the key feature here is removing parking to the perimeter and then making the entire campus a walkable setting. Uh, and it's all within about a five minute walk. Next. But another key aspect of this uh, is that we're actually adding housing to the installation and the housing partner has been a part of this and starting to think about how people can live closer, much closer to where they work. Next. And what we've been doing is we've been doing some energy planning uh, and this was the first process of looking at an energy master plan tied to the area development plans where we actually project their future requirement for in this case energy, about 22 million kilowatt hours. We look at our planning strategies can get us a 35% reduction just by sustainable planning. We're not talking about buildings. Uh, and then if we do on-site renewable energy, we can get another 36% reduction. So we can reduce it all the way down to about 8 million kilowatt hours with just good planning. And then when we add great buildings to this, then we can get to net zero. So master planning can't get us to net zero. It can help us move towards net zero. And we combine that with buildings, we're in better shape. So I'm going to walk through a few of these so you can see how we integrate energy into the planning process. Next. One of the strategies that we look at is narrow facilities. Certainly this is common in Europe and becoming much more common in the US. And Andrea talked about that as part of the UFC. And when we look at kind of the typical army facilities, these days of lead silver type buildings, we'll get about a 6% reduction in energy use. But when we look at simply going to narrow buildings with very affordable strategies, we can easily get a 40% reduction in energy use. This isn't even going as far as the NREL building in Denver. This is based on about 10.57 kilowatt hours per square foot for green buildings. The NREL building is at 4.4 kilowatt hours per square foot, but they use a lot of expensive technologies. We're just saying let's create nice buildings with windows that work to create better, more energy efficient environments. Next. And then when we look at the cool roofs, another strategy, uh, if we do them on existing buildings, we can get a 10% reduction. If we put them on all the buildings, we can get about a 12.4% reduction. Next slide. And then, so that's energy kind of, re when we talk about reduction, that's the key, but then there's recovery. And in this case, using PV, we looked at wind and geothermal and other technologies, but PV works the best in this area. And when we look at kind of the master plan on our new buildings, our infill buildings only, we get a 23% reduction. And when we add PV panels to all the appropriate buildings, we can get up to about a 36% uh, reduction. Next. We also look at water. This is a part of net zero. So we look at their projected water requirement of 26 million gallons. Uh, and that can be about a 50% reduction down to 12 million if we look at water catchment uh, in the state of Massachusetts. We're allowed to do that. And then if we do on-site stormwater mitigation, we can actually go net negative uh, here. And we'll talk about a few strategies next. Certainly building rainwater catchment using our roof, catching the water and then storing it uh, is a very straightforward solution. And we can get a 52% reduction uh, using our master plan building strategies. And this works in parallel with PV systems. Next. Reducing impervious surfaces is a big aspect. Uh, currently, it's about 54% impervious surface. Uh, adding the new plan, we drop it a little bit to 47%. Uh, and, and then if we add green roofs, which then would not be done in parallel with cool roofs, so we have to make a decision, but we could get down to a 24% reduction. Next. And then we do a lot of calculations on street trees and the benefits of street trees. And we start to look at where they're at, kind of the master plan, because trees can mitigate stormwater. Uh, significant savings, 22 to 44 percent reduction, depending on how aggressive we are in a street tree planting program. So the trees aren't necessarily about aesthetics. They're about energy reduction and water reduction. Next. And parks and quads, certainly campuses have these, but we don't think of these as just attractive open spaces, they become part of our green infrastructure plan. And we can see when we look at parks and quads, we can drop our 
water from 40% to 80%, depending on the utilization rate. Next. And then lastly, in terms of waste, this is an important aspect. Uh, they currently have a reutilization program uh, that gets a 60% reduction, and we're adding to that a recycling, compost, and concrete diversion program that can get us about a 72% reduction. So in all cases, energy, water, and waste, master planning doesn't get us to net zero, but it gets us a significant reduction. Next. So I'm going to turn it over to Jerry uh, to wrap this up. Jerry? Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, next slide. You know, what we see here is basically a holistic approach to the way we build installation uh, for, for be able to meet the needs of today as well as preserving long-term low tech capabilities of the, of the future. We can do they, that and be able to create sustainable energy efficient development. These planning processes, this holistic approach to development, and it causes us to think about sustainable compact development and also can create energy savings at the same time we normally build and develop our installations. And this is not just us that we in the Army can do, but other services can do as well. As we go into a more joint based environment, this is very, very important. But, but what this really does at the end of the day is create a ability to meet mission requirements today but be able to preserve our military installations for the future for the unforeseen mission that we don't even know yet. And I mean, you can bet your dollar and donut, you can be able to anticipate more missions that we didn't know about and be able to anticipate these in the future. Next slide. So, you know, when you talk about this thing called planning, it's not an installation thing. It's not a headquarters thing. It's the whole enterprise and being able to work with the service headquarters, our installations, our design and construction agents and major commands together to be able to meet our mission needs at the same time to, to and also address low impact development, sustainability, all these comprehensive issues that can't be done in a stovepipe but comprehensive together. And that's what the value of master planning does, to be able to put all these uh, issues together in a holistic manner to be able to meet the mission day for today and tomorrow. But to do that requires four tenets. First thing, we've got to have leadership buy-in. Our, our leaders, our garrison commanders, our base commanders, our senior mission commanders, they got to be part of the planning process. And they got to champion to embrace this comprehensive, holistic, uh, a collaborative approach of planning. We've got to have a consistent approach in planning for an installation. That's, that means typical standards, the way we do things. So we have a consistent approach that we see a way we plan and develop our installations. We can have people to understand what planning is, a true competency throughout the enterprise, that thinking long-term, what's the long-term impact of things, and how do we implement and facilitate this planning approach. And really, we've got to start thinking about the culture, the culture of not thinking about today of a project specific project, but the impact of this project to overall development installation. That enterprise approach is something that we all have to buy into, no matter with the planner at Fort Eustis, the, uh, the designer and the project manager at headquarters USAID, or the program manager at the Axum on, on, on Ms. Hammock's office. It's all the same thing, understanding the enterprise approach, providing facilities and services for our, for our Army and DOD for now and the future. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, okay, so really, it's really about sustainable energy efficient planning. And really what evolves is more than just sitting in a box on your desk doing a 1391. It's getting to work with the stakeholders and the community and the com and team at, a, at the whole installation. Be able to uh, collaboratively together get a solution for now and the future. So what we want to be able to do is great places for live today in the future. So really that's what really what we're talking about. It's a change in the way we we really provide planning to our installations. It's it's really getting to know the customer, the stakeholders, the units, and being able to together build build a planning for the future. And that's and so that's really the end of the presentation at UFC. Uh, so I can open up for any questions if there's any. Thank you guys for doing this presentation. We really appreciate your time. 
Um, we have about four minutes left, so we have a few questions. If anybody else would like to ask a question, there is a box in the upper left-hand corner of your screen labeled Q&A, and you can type that question in to either myself or either of our presenters, or you can raise your hand with the hand icon, and I can uh, give you the speaking privileges so that you can ask the question yourself. Um, we have one question so far. Uh, the question is from Shaw. Are these principles a part of the Searle ESTCP project titled Demonstrate Energy Component of Installation Master Plan Using Net Zero Installation Virtual Test Bed? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so Annette Stump from Searle said, no, I don't think so. So I don't think those are part of it. Um, some Bob Hillgartner from Fort Campbell has asked, when will the USACE planning centers yeah. be stood up? Uh, the question is, when the planning centers be stood up? Uh, we have uh, uh, five stood up right now. Uh, uh, in your support area, uh, Mark Real and his company in Louisville are all stood up and can provide that support with you, as well as Huntsville, Mobile, Savannah, uh, Fort Worth, and Sacramento. And, and um, uh, I'm just talking to my hand right now if I forgot one, but we are working on North Atlantic Division, Northwest Division, POD, with the rest of them by the you end of the calendar year. Here? Yeah, I think Jerry covered all of them. Uh, the ones that are stood up are Mobile, Savannah, Louisville, Fort Worth, Sacramento, and Huntsville. And we just, in process, we have NAD, NWD, and POD. Great. I, I'm getting a few more questions in. So Stephanie Smith from JBLM um, asked a few questions. The first one, how do we include land opportunity costs in life cycle cost analysis when comparing OH to UG utility development, ergo power and telecom? Either of you guys want to take that? <laughs> that's a lot, that's a difficult question. I all right, so another thing that. we can do, Jerry, is um, I can send you some of these questions and uh, we can honest, uh, really, uh, write a response and send it in later. Okay, the oh, second well, question to. is, has there been a push towards assigning low-impact development features like Thank stormwater retention question. ponds, bioswales, permeable pavement, um, and facility codes so that we can capture them in the budget model and get SRM funding for them? I, I think they have. Is I believe the the the, the Axum has been working on that with I think our folks in engineering construction. Uh, um, uh, uh, Lindsay, didn't the civil engineering folks been working on those models? Yes, we do have uh, Paul Dicker, I believe, working with low impact development, but I'm not sure Lindsay, did you where he is in working with that specifically. Yeah. Mark, did you have something you wanted to add? I just want to add that you know low impact development has been a key feature of the master planning process since kind of Jerry and Andrea have taken a look at this and we're looking to integrate it better with the landscape architectural community to make sure that you know we're planning for a comprehensive solution not just a building based solution or a landscape based solution but they work together throughout the process. All right, and that's all the questions, and we're exactly at time. Uh, thank you all for presenting with us today. I truly appreciate your time and effort that it took. It was a very successful presentation, um, very clear, concise, and I personally learned a lot from it. Um, this is a recorded presentation. It will be available on Friday on our website, https colon backslash backslash mrsi.usace.army.mil backslash sustained. Uh, and I will have the slides available there as well. So thank you guys. If you have any other questions or comments or recommendations, please feel free to email me.
Thank you.